Okay. So uh, the title of my talk is Modeling Surface Water, Groundwater and Nitrate Processes in a Restored Riparian Wetland. This modeling work was done by DHI Denmark in collaboration with the University yeah, so this work was um, done by DHI Denmark, the modelling work, in collaboration with uh, two universities in Denmark, University of Aarhus and University of Copenhagen, uh, who've provided most of the input data and calibration data for this work. Um, riparian wetlands have uh, significant impacts on the ecological status of rivers, estuaries and fjords. Um, Wetlands are increasingly used uh, in river basin management plans across Europe for uh, improving the ecological status of water bodies, and this relates to the Water Framework Directive. Uh, functions are multiple. Um, they're not only of rec recreational value, but they have a wide, ranging, wi wide range of habitats. They retain floodwaters and they also retain sediments and nutrients. In Denmark, one of the big issues is nitrate uh, leaching from agricultural sources, diffuse, uh, diffuse sources, and um, Danish action plans actually include the restoration of um, rivers and floodplains um, in the coming years to reduce particularly uh, nitrate loadings. Um, the aim is to transform about 16,000 hectares of farmland into wetlands. And this is a process that's already on ongoing. Um, now, the aim of this study was to examine the controlling flow processes and the nitrogen retention capacity of riparian wetlands using the hydrological modeling system Mike Shi Ecolab. The approach uh, has been threefold. So the first step was to develop a, um, an integrated hydrological model um, of a wetland uh, using uh, measured data, uh, hydrological data, and then based on this model, develop a water quality model uh, using the flow results to describe nitrate reductions both in the surface of the wetland but also in the subsurface. Finally, based on the model results, we've... Um, the aim is to make an assessment of um, nitrate removal potential and also look at how we might be able to improve the designs of wetlands in future to increase the nitrate retention capacity. This model approach has been tested on a restored wetland um, called Bunimela, located on Fyn in Denmark. Now, um, for those of you who don't know much about Mike Shi. Mike Shi is a physically based hydrological integrated model. It has a 2D uh, overland flow description um, combined with a 1D um, or coupled with a 1D unsaturated zone model and a 3D saturated zone model. It's also linked with Mike 11, so it's got a fully hydrodynamic river solution, um, 1D river solution. Um, it, it also handles the transport of species, so nutrients, for example, by advection dispersion, and it, it does have a water quality model of its own. But it's not particularly flexible and doesn't include all the processes that we'd like to include in our wetland model or wanted to include in our wetland model. So Mike Shi has also been linked to uh, Ecolab, which is an ecological process-based model. It has a um, number of um, templates that can be customized to your particular problem. So basically, you define the processes that you want to include. You, you, you write the equations yourself, which is a great advantage. Um, so just to show you the processes that we've included in the different components of our model. So in the unsaturated zone, we have got... Oops, We've included uh, nit nitrification and denitrification. The same in the saturated zone. Uh, we've got a slightly different description in the top peat layer, where we assume that um, denitrification reduces exponentially. The highest rates typically occur right at the boundary between the surface water and groundwater. 
com uh, compartment. In the, in the um, <laughs> overland uh, component, we've got a lot more processes included. So we've got plant production and plant uptake to meet this plant production. It's a fairly simple model. We assume that plant production is only dependent on light radia radiation and not actually availability of nutrients in this case. Uh, we've got plant death, uh, microbial death, immobilization, mineralization, desorption, absorption. So all these processes are included. I should mention we've also got, there's also plant uptake from the unsaturated and unsaturated zones, but that's included in a very simplified manner just through um, evapotranspiration in Mike Shi. Now, um, this approach has been tested on a wetland uh, located in Denmark, over here. Oh, let's see if I can point to it, over here. Um, it's located along one of the main rivers on Fyn called Ulnse Oh. Um, originally, um, the stream had been straightened, so that's the, the black line, and then in 2000, Three, it was re-meandered to look like this. And Aarhus University took some measurements of river stages during a um, medium flood in 2012. So those water depths we have for model validation. Um, also, the channel bed was raised at the same time and cross sections were reduced by 50%. Now, um, our study, uh, we actually looked at the whole catchment. That's the black line for setting up catchment model. And then the main study area is the gray area here. And in this area, um, Copenhagen of University do, uh, set up these three transects and they took measurements of groundwater levels um, at on five dates in 2011 and they also took water quality measurements um, including uh, nitri different nitrogen components and other components as well. Um, I've also shown a, a cross-section. It's a fairly simple geology uh, here. Now, what we did was we set up a, initially set up a catchment model and calibrated that against uh, available groundwater levels and uh, stages in the wetland. And then we set up a local model just covering the wetland itself using the larger model uh, as the boundary condition for the small model. And then we did the water quality modeling for this small wetland area. The geological model is very simple. It's a one meter peat layer um, underlain by 12 meters of sand. We've set the model up in using different scales. The results I'm showing here are mainly in 12 and a half meters, a half, 12 and a half meter grid and a 25 meter grid. Uh, aquifer properties and process rates were measured by Copenhagen or University of Copenhagen, so we had those directly from them. And then in order to look at the actual effect of the wetland, we decided to set up a model for the current situation, but also a model for the pre-restoration scenario, so we could measure the, uh, the effect. Um, finally, I should say we <laughs> entered into a data agreement with University of Copenhagen three years ago. Uh, with the understanding that we wouldn't publish anything and they, until they had published their work. And as it happens, they haven't done that yet. Um, and when we put in this abstract, we didn't think this would be a problem, <laughs> but apparently it is. So that means I can't actually show the model fit. I'm not allowed to show any of the data yet. Um, but what I will do is show, um, I'll show uh, some of the model results and what the modeling is showing so far. Now, this is a sh uh, snapshot of flooding uh, of the wetland in January 2011 uh, during a, rather a fairly large flood. Uh, what it shows is that we have bank overtopping, real bank overtopping at various locations along the stream and water's flowing through the wetland to the north, leaving the wetland over here and re-entering the river up north. And uh, time series showing that there were quite a few flood events in, in um, 2011. There were actually three fairly big ones, one in the summer as well. 
I have shown one observation that was taken by University of Aarhus, so that was all right. And what it does show is that um, the model slightly underestimates levels. Um, we did, uh, or someone else did actually set up a, a Mike Flood model, and that, got us, that also had the same issues with slight underestimation. So we think it might be a data issue, not, not issues with the models themselves. Um, now, um, just to show what ha what's happening in the subsurface, what I wanted to illustrate was the changing gradients during wet and dry conditions. So dur during a flood, for example, these, these um, lines are the groundwater levels in the sand layer and the peat layer. And there's, a, there's always, a, or most of the time, a gradient, an upward gradient. So water's coming from the agricultural fields out here coming up and then you've got during a flood event you've actually got high levels in the river right here forcing water this way so there's some st stagnation going on for a few weeks typically and then during dry conditions obviously you've got water coming that way and um, the aquifer is feeding the river instead um, now again this is again to illustrate so the dynamics um, so you see the water level going, water depth going up here during a flood event, and I've plotted the the groundwater levels in the peat and the sand, and there's a reversal of the gradient. So during the couple of weeks during the flood, uh, there's actually a downward gradient from the peat to the sand layer. Uh, you also see the river net inflow to the wetland, and these are also to illustrate this reversal of gradients. So normally you've got uh, groundwater flow, uh, boundary inflow, but during the flood event, this reverses. And the same goes for the base flow to the river. That's also reversing during the couple of weeks of the flood. Now, this was to show um, the hydro periods and flood frequency uh, pre and post restoration. And what we see is that a large part of the wetland was flooded for more than two weeks at a time, on average, uh, post-restoration. There's also some uh, water on the ground in the pre-restoration scenario. But looking at the water balance, it's not due to overtopping of the river. It's actually rising groundwater or seepage from the river into the wetland. Um, and it's the same pattern when you look at the flood frequencies. And this is, uh, shows the nitrate plume, so assuming uh, nitrates coming in from the agri agricultural fields at the edge of the wetland. This is pre-restoration and post-restoration. And it might look as though more nitrate is being removed in the pre-restoration scenario, but that's actually not the case. What's happening is we've got more of an upward gradient, and that's because this area was drained before restoration, so we've included drains in the top half meter of the wetland. That means nitrate is forced up and is removed by the drains here. And now I, I know I said I couldn't show any <laughs> observations, but I've put in a line here to illustrate where the observations or measurements are showing that nitrate has been removed completely. And this shows that some of our process rates are probably somewhat underestimated because the observations do show that all the nitrate is removed. Uh, at this location. Um, anyway, um, so this um <coughs> is a mass balance showing uh, how much nitrate is being removed from uh, the wetland. And as you can see, there's a large surface water removal, 117 kilos per hectare per year, compared to only one in the restoration scenario and that's obviously due to frequent flooding um, in the of the wetland and then what we also see is that <coughs> um, quite a large proportion of nitrate coming in from the surrounding fields and from the river uh, into the groundwater is being removed it's 17 kilos uh, much less than from the surface water um, but it's about 70 percent of what's coming in um, pre-restoration, in the pre-restoration scenario, it's with 13 kilos. But when you look at how much is coming in, it's actually a lot more. And this is because we're using 
a fixed concentration on the boundary or the edge of the wetland. And we're changing the hydrology, so the mass flux in the pre-restoration scenario is actually much bigger. So you water's coming in faster due to drainage, and we get more ma uh, mass coming in. So only about 47% of nitrate was removed prior to restoration. So in summary, our model is able to simulate the hydrology and the nitrate. We are underestimating nitrate removal slightly. Um, the evidence from the observations is that all the nitrate is removed before it reaches the river. Uh, so that means that the modeling indicates that removal rates are in the order of 130 to 140 kilograms per hectare per year. And this is pretty much in line with uh, values uh, given by the uh, Danish Agricultural Institute of about 100 to 200 kilograms per year. Those were published last year. Um, then our model also show that shows that um, nitrate removal during uh, flooding from the river accounts for most of the nitrate removal, about 90%. Um, the removal of drains and the restoration of the natural groundwater flow also makes a difference and it, it incre increases retention times and thereby nitrate removal on the subsurface as well. Um, so in terms of future work, um, we're planning on doing some more sensitivity, uncertainty analysis of some of the input parameters. Uh, we'd like to investigate the effects of different wetland designs. It's not something we've decided yet, but we're thinking of ways of maybe increasing um, the, the uh, flood durations artificially. Um, and then <coughs> we're considering investigating or doing a model of the full catchment for the full re meander section of the river. Um, this involves different boundary conditions, maybe using a, an agricultural model to look at how much is actually leaching from the, from the agricultural areas. And then finally, we're considering looking at the effects of climate change as well on nitrate retention. So um, this is all. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And this is just showing an uh, animation of the nitrate movement of the nitrate plume. Thank you very much, and uh, feel free to ask questions. Yeah.